and welcome. My name's Merlin Crossley. I'm the DVC Education here. And it's terrific to see you all at the first of these Scientia Education Academy lectures. And we have a treat in store because we have one of my colleagues from the School of Babs. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Bejigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to any elders, uh, past and present, and any Indigenous people here tonight. So these lectures are a tremendous initiative. I thank Jeff Crisp, uh, PVC Education, who came up with the idea and has been building the Scienti Education Academy in order to celebrate what the extraordinary work that is done by our great education staff and by many of us, so many of our staff at UNSW. I think we have some absolutely fantastic teaching going on at UNSW. And the only thing is that we don't celebrate it enough. I think some of our teachers are like the people who write the scripts or the music in films. You often know the actors. Everyone can list Australia's top 10 actors. We can probably list a couple of the people who do the musical scores, but script writers are rare things indeed. Whereas great university teachers are both designers, script writers, computer programmers, and sometimes they're good actors as well. And tonight, we have someone who has all <laughs> of those qualities. And on top of that, she's a great molecular biologist as well. Now, I should just make a few personal reflections on Louise. You can see in the program tonight, there's a few comments about Louise's career. She's graduated from here. She's worked in San Francisco. She's uh, done uh, molecular biology research for many years. It also mentioned she's won nine teaching awards. After she'd won them all and I was Dean of Science, I had to set up a new one for her to win, <laughs> which she did promptly. Uh, she's won national awards. Uh, university-wide awards, faculty awards, all of these different awards. But, you know, I've only seen Louise teach a couple of times, and it has been superb. I think Louise would probably know when. It's been at the Open Days, UNSW Open Days. I've seen her actually give talks, and I can see how she engages with the students. And I think it's a shame more people don't see what she actually does. But... Some of you will know I share a, uh, we've just moved to a new building, but I shared uh, the off I had the office next door to Louise in Babs. And what you won't know is that as well as being a great uh, teacher, academic, scientist, Louise is a very good advisor. And every now and then I'd have time off and I'd see Louise there and I would go in and talk to Louise about the university, about teaching, about students, about some of the things she was doing, and I'd ask her various questions. And I would be always waiting for her, her advice. But I have to tell you this, it was like talking to the Delphic Oracle, because Louise was so careful in what she said that I always wondered, wandered out wondering exactly what I'd been told, because she would tiptoe around this. And I asked my students, and they always told me Louise was the most direct person in the whole university. So I. So I don't really know, but it's been, it was very helpful for me to, uh, to think about the big issues facing the university with Louise. And the biggest issue is, I think, how to make life better for our students, particularly as we have more and more students. And I'm looking around the audience. I know that many of you have dedicated yourself to this task. And Jeff Crisp, who's here, is absolutely leading a transformation of enhancing our education through using every latest technology and every new approach possible, and I know Louise is doing the same. So without further ado, I invite you up here to tackle this new te technological age of teaching. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Thank you so much, Merlin. Um, I'm almost, I, for me, almost rendered speechless, which any of you who know me will know. That's a rare event and one that many people look forward to uh, very, very anxiously, but it won't stop me from chatting now. The first thing I really wanted to say is I am so very grateful to 
Jeff and to Merlin um, and to my colleagues here at UNSW for the creation of the Scientia Education Academy. Um, obviously it's something that's very dear to my heart and I feel it finally starts to give educators recognition that is, is so very well deserved. Um, we know that much of the funding to this university comes from our students, so ensuring they have a worthwhile experience to me is what really, really matters. The other thing I'm very grateful and honoured is that um, we're going to have this series of lectures and I've been invited to be the first, and I won't speculate on whether that was get the worst out of the way first, but um, I will try and make sure that at least I provide you with some entertainment tonight. So the other thing I've done is what I have strongly advised all of my students. Um, we just had some students practising their presentations earlier today. And I said, whatever you do, practise it ahead of time. Don't do anything different. I've decided to try out some brand new technology I've never used before. So if you're going to be an innovator in technology, you might as well give it a whirl. And why not do it publicly? Therefore, everyone can share with me if this falls apart. Plus, I can't use my beloved Mac. They've put me on a PC. <laughs> That's a little, a little hint to, to the folks in the front row. Um, when I came to this university, I'd actually been doing research in California, as Merlin alluded to, and I've been working with NASA looking at the impact of radiation on um, cells in humans and in mice, with the um, issue being if we send a mission to Mars, will we actually get the crew back safely? Will they get cancer? So that's what I've been researching when I arrived here. When I arrived here, of course, I was told, well, that's great, you can continue to research, but you also need to teach. I thought, okay, I can do that. I'll do what any good, te any good scientist does. I'll go look it up. And I pulled up this great book, Learning to Teach in Higher Education. I thought, there we go, cheat sheet, I'll be right. And I went, oh, my gosh. Okay, I've got to be able to do <coughs> all of those things. Well, I guess I'll sort of start at the beginning, as the song says, and I'll just sort of work my way through. Desire to share love, yep. That's not a problem. Ability to make the material stimulating and interesting. Mm, okay. Engaging, capacity to explain it plainly. I was working through the list. Then I went and saw the lecture theatres. No computers. When I started, no lecture theatre had a computer in it. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be interesting. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do it somehow. I'll make it work with the chalkboard, maybe. And then I thought about it and I thought, you know, even if you're Einstein, I don't know that you can necessarily make all of it fascinating on a chalkboard. So I went looking, as Merlin mentioned, we've just moved and I was packing up all my files. This is one of my very first teaching aids. This is an overhead transparency that I used in my lectures. The beautiful, you can see, they hired me hopefully for my science, certainly not for my artist skills. I traced that. That's, that was the virtue of overhead transparencies. Nothing about copyright here, just go ahead and trace. And that's what I did. And I thought, okay. I guess I can do this. Then I got innovative. I used coloured pens when I did the tracing to make it even more interesting. Um, you can imagine transitions weren't that easy with overhead transparencies. So it really was a bit of an issue for my teaching. And it wasn't just that I had no artistic skills and I could barely write in a straight line. It was that what I wanted to teach was 3D realities of very, very, very small objects cells and what occurs with inside cells. And this is very, very hard to actually give a sense of when you show a great big diagram like this and you go, this is fascinating, this is a cell. And you can think the students are like, maybe. So then we got fancier and we kind of got this rendition of a cell. And I thought, well, OK, maybe we're getting a bit better. But truly, what I actually thought was in true sense of understanding, I didn't really think so. I thought, no, I don't actually think there's actually any great real understanding of the complexities and the wonder of what happens inside a cell. So then, fortunately for me now, we're playing with the technology here. What we have is something like this. And I'm only going to give you a very short amount of this. I didn't develop this. But, oh, I'm so grateful we have now reached this kind of a stage in what we can use as teaching resources. This is, we've just moved inside a cell. And what you're seeing here is there is a skeleton inside the cell, like there is in our body. It organises the inside of the cell. 
itself. But it's dynamic. It can bend and move just like we can. It changes shape. It helps organize how molecules move through the cell. It is so flexible that it can break and reseal as it should. This is the molecular highway through the cell. These are called the microtubules. We say they're dynamic in matches. This is one of the wonders. This is a molecular protein. It's moving along that highway, carrying its cargo of proteins that are membrane bound through the cell. Here's the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell on your right. There's the nucleus. And coming out of the nucleus is the genetic information, the RNA that's going to be used to make those proteins. And now you can actually see how they're made inside the cell. Now I'm tempted to keep watching this movie with you because I actually think it is now the protein's being escorted. I promise it won't go too long. It's being escorted to the mitochondria so that it can be used so it's taken to the correct place. This protein's actually being put through a pore in the Golgi apparatus because it's going to get modified. And when it's modified, it will get packed up inside that membrane vesicle and then it will be carried to the external part of the cell. And I'll stop right there. Can you see the wonder to me is that we now have, and I'll stop it there, we now have this amazing capacity to engage with our students and this is what's happened in the time that I've been teaching. We've gone from blackboards to this. So. When I think about the technological changes that we've seen in my time, probably this has been one of the most wondrous, is these resources that are now available to us. We also have, I think any of you have heard the, heard the TED Talks, seen the TED Talks? Well, there's now TED-Ed. TED-Ed has some amazing little videos and movies for students, animations. It also has multiple choice questions to accompany them so that the students can actually work with this on their own, this is a wonderful resource that's available to students online. There are multiple resources that are available to students online now. So of course this then raises the question that we're all asking, is this still relevant? So this is a lovely image, it's from the 1350s and it is your typical lecture. Um, very reminiscent I would say, do we have a functional bit of technology here? Pointed at some, oh. Suddenly that dot. I have no idea. So, what we have here, I just love this because here we have the sage on the stage, the classic mode of teaching. Here we have the students that look very much like the students we have now, the front row sucking up. Yes, 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 give me the marks. Uh, that I had a great night last night. The, let me just show you this great new thing I just discovered on Facebook and tell you all about it. So the question is, is this, if that's the way we taught and what teaching occurred back in the 1350s, is it still relevant today? So are teachers redundant? Do we really, need, if everyone can find what they need online using technology, do we need teachers anymore? Begs the question of why we're sitting here in this format right now together and whether we think it has value that we come together as a community, but anyway. So if you Google DNA, that's an area I teach, if you Google that, and I did it a couple of days ago, you get about 420 million hits, 420 million. So who guides and scaffolds this learning for the students? If you say to them, it's all there online, go find the resources you need online and use them when this is the kind of information they have to struggle with, especially in this information age. It's very challenging. And the other is, who moderates it? So when I was at school, you knew if it was in the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, you could pretty much trust it. But of the 420 million hits you get for DNA online, can you trust all of them? And that is the question that we have. I'm just trying to see if I can make this microphone work. Yes, so that I'm not reliant on that. So who moderates and who looks after it? And the other thing that worries me if we go to a fully online digital world for our students is social connections. 
So yes, we can get so much of the information and resources that we need from the, the online world, from using it, and we can guide our students to that online world as well. We can shape it for them. It doesn't have to be just shaped in a face-to-face in a -face teaching situation. But we lose this. We lose this social connectivity that I think is so very important for all of us. And in fact, I was walking around campus the other day and this is what I saw. And you might think, well, that's great, Louise, it's just a picture of the Chancellery, and it is indeed a picture of the Chancellery. And there's the young lady sitting here all alone trying to do her work on her computer. And I thought, oh, oh, this is not good. This is not what we want for our students, is that they don't have some degree of social connection with their peers. Um, I was talking to my nephew who's in business and he said to me, oh, I'd much rather everything online. It's so boring coming to uni. And I said, didn't you just move in with your beautiful new partner? Yes, he said. And I said, where did you meet her? Oh, at a lecture at uni. I said, ah, oh, there we go, okay. Maybe it does still have some value for us. So this is <laughs> my comment <laughs> is, yep, that's what I actually say to students sometimes. No, nope, Twittering ain't going to do it. I'm so sorry. So if what we think is that we actually want students to come to lectures but we want some connectivity, what I'd like you to do is do what you're never asked to do at any kind of gathering like this. I'd like you please to pull out your mobile phones. I'd like you to turn them on and I would like you to log in. And let's just see what we can do to perhaps make our lectures a little more connective. So please do log on. It's zetings.com and it's slash Louise LM for Louise Lutzi Mann. So Louise LM, they're L's, and Louise does have an I in it. It would be nice if it didn't keep doing that, though. How's everyone going? Everyone on? Should, can you now see this slide? <laughs> Because what I'd like you to do then is I would like you, once you've logged on, to follow my slides and I'd like you to poll in for me. Where's it? <laughs> you know, when I practice, I'll tell you a little, an anecdote once you've logged on. And don't forget, once you've done it, only 70 of you responded, don't forget to hit submit. Just logging on and hit, clicking your choice won't do it. I'm actually, of course, conducting a social survey here just to see how many people are as addicted as me to... You can probably guess with me what it is. So, once you've had a chance, what I can now do is we can immediately start having a look at how everyone in. Anyone worried they haven't had a chance? Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. How about you come in for the next one? How would that be? Okay, so now let's have a look and see. <laughs> I find that so fascinating. So what we now have is some information about each other, which we may not have had before. But the other part that I love about this is when I tried this with my students, um, Chocolate got about two votes. That was myself and my colleague, Wendy. And all the rest of the Facebook was just way, way out there, which would impress me because I thought beer and wine might come in first. So now we have a way of working out that we actually have some like-minded souls in this class because 56% of us couldn't live without chocolate. Thank you very much to those who voted chocolate on my behalf. So now that you're familiar with it, let's try this one, which is a little closer to what I would be doing surveying my genetic students. Your sister is just called to tell you she is expecting twins. Which of the following is more likely? Assume she is not having identical twins. So she's not having identical twins. Which is more likely? Two boys, two girls, a boy and a girl. All are equally likely. Don't forget, no one knows what you vote, so you don't have to be, feel too nervous. You can just go with your instinct here. Okay. So I'm going to close the polling. 
and let's see what you all decided. Okay, 57% of you think all are equally likely. Some of you think two boys, or more optimistically, maybe two girls. Some of you think one boy and one girl. I'm going to give you a minute to persuade the person sitting next to you to change their vote. Please persuade the person sitting next to you. Obviously, all choices were chosen. You don't have to be embarrassed about the choice you took. But please persuade your colleague to change their vote. Okay, what I'd like you to do is re-poll. Now that you've persuaded your colleague to change their vote, please re-poll and let's see if we get the same, the same answer now that you've had an opportunity to share information. So please poll again. Okay, I'm going to close the polling. Closing, closing. If you haven't submitted, last chance coming, last chance coming. Let's see whether, in fact, you've managed to persuade your colleague to change their vote. Ah, so. So now we've gone from a major, just majority voting for all or equally likely to now just over a majority going for one boy and one girl. And what I hope you see is that what I wanted, of course, to have happen here is that what you've just engaged in is what we call peer teaching. You've now engaged your colleagues, you've now been comfortable to share your knowledge because you've already seen the votes up there, so you don't have to be too nervous about espousing any particular cause. And when I use this in lectures, it's one of the most effective tools I have to get the students actually engaged and interested in a lecture. They love polling. They love trying to get the right answer. And perhaps like them, you'd like to know what the right answer is. OK, so here's how we work it out. With the first twin, there are two possibilities. You can have a boy or a girl. And the second twin, of course, you can have a boy or a girl. So if you follow it through, you have a boy. Second twin can be a boy or a girl. So you can have a boy, 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 girl. First twin, a girl. Second one, again, can be a boy or a girl. Girl, boy, girl, girl. So you can see it's more likely that you will have one of each if they're not identical twins. Okay. So congratulations to those of you who managed to persuade your colleagues to actually change their vote. I'm very, very impressed. The next slide I had in here for you, yes. I know, that's what I love, is when I hear this amount of noise in a lecture theatre, it's like, yes, yes. Next slide I have for you was going to have you poll again, and it was to look at some myths, you know, like high fructose corn syrup is worse for you than sugar, rubbish. Um, <laughs> Superfoods are wonderful, rubbish. Um, but I decided in the interest of time I would move on. Oh, I forgot to remind you what's good. Students respond anonymously, so they're willing to take risks and vote. By the way, if ever you do a show of hands in a lecture, you know it's very, very hard to persuade students. Poll, not a problem. With their phones, giving them licence to use their phone. Absolutely. Um, you can actually track the responses so that you can capture the data. This is fantastic when you're trying to work out what misconceptions the students might have around some of the learning. And when I've used it, some of the responses have has surprised me considerably where I have thought something was quite transparent. And the polling showed me, no, actually it's not. It really helps you work out what you need to focus on. 
Um, they're far, like you, happy to engage in subsequent discussion. I find that really, really great, especially if you want to do something that might have, for instance, things that might be a bit sensitive around ethical issues of science, where they'd be very uncomfortable to talk about, should we let elderly people die? They cost, they've already had a good chance of life. Should we spend more money on them? Should we do gene therapy? Is that where society is a fantastic tool for that? Um, and it does help the students really become motivated as you were to discuss more. And you can, in fact, get numerical responses. This is where I used it, um, not on something quite as engaging as twin studies, but on the structure of cells. And what I could see is where, if their students were stumbling, you can see from some of the numbers, I could then focus on that particular area and why they were stumbling on that particular area. The other thing that matters a lot to me, apart from providing students with an engaging experience, is I actually think we need a scientifically literate populace, not just the students who come to our lectures, but as a population. And I think most of you are familiar with that, that uh, saying, lies, damn lies, and uh, statistics. So this one, of course, engaged me very much as soon as I saw this ad. 400% more weight loss over six weeks. I'm like, oh, I'm in. Brilliant. Of course, the tricky part when I looked at what lipozine does for you, the no lipozine group gained about two pounds over six weeks. The, um, the ones who are on it lost about two pounds over the six weeks. So they interpret that as a 400% weight loss difference. <laughs> but the ad looks great, right? So this is what worries me. The average adult has one testicle, right? You need to stop and think about statistics. Yes, if we're 50% female and 50% male, on average, which is why averages are really things that should not be used, it's really not great. 80% of all kids want homework on Saturdays. Well, yes, if you tell them the choice is to go to school, they'll choose homework. You have to ask 80% compared to what was the alternate choice. And this is what I think we're missing in our training of young people today. Um, over 2 million Americans exposed to drinking water will die every year. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, and this one brings up the correlation is not causation, one of my little pet concerns. So I think you know, and this is one that's very close to my heart, is that there's been a severe downturn, in, not severe, but there has been a downturn in the number of vaccinations because there's been considered to be a correlation between vaccinations and the incidence of autism in the populace. And this, of course, is concern. And of course, what my point is, correlation is not causation. Just because these two curves correlate very, very well doesn't mean that vaccinations are the cause of autism. Of course, we do know the other way doesn't work. Autism isn't the cause of vaccinations. So if you look at this data, though, you might think, oh, I can see where they might be concerned, this group who are very concerned about autism and vaccinations, but I actually played a trick on you because this is actually what the data was. It's the fact that organic food sales correlate very, very highly with autism. So if you're going to make that kind of specious argument, can I throw it back at them and say, well, actually, it's actually organic food. If you stopped eating organic food, your children wouldn't be autistic. So, <laughs> well... That's what the data, that's the way people interpret the data. So I think it's um, very, very worrying that we don't have a proper understanding of what the, what the meaning of, of uh, science is and the data. This is one that came out in the UK. Oral con contraceptive pills increase the risk of thrombosis by 100%. What they forgot to mention is it was, in fact, the rate went from one woman in 7,000 to two women in 7,000 but that's a 100% increase. It's just the risk is vanishingly small, but there was an increase. Yes, that's unfortunate. The consequence, there were 13,000 additional abortions the following year in the UK, considered to be linked to actually this. So I think this is why I feel we have a really, really, um, I'm on a vendetta, I guess, for science education. Knowledge of science is vital, we're in an increasingly technological age, and it matters that we pro proselytise this. The federal government is cut, making cuts to universities and to science. It will harm Australia in many ways, but also in the global economy. We live in an era of unprecedented access to all that information I've been showing you, and we're in the era of Trump and alternative facts. So how do we distinguish fake 
from fact. And I think this is something that is so important that we not lose sight of this and why it is important that we provide all the resources that we possibly can for science education in the community. Um, and I'm very pleased, I think Elizabeth Anksman's here. We have a CEIF grant, thank you very much, Jeff, to um, actually support science high school teachers in their rollout of the new curriculum, and that's an initiative led by Elizabeth, which I think is wonderful that we have. Thanks, Liz. So, how do we do it? Well, this is what we, I started with at UNSW in my vendetta for science education. This is the Biosciences Building. And this is what the labs looked like when I started. That was then. And as Merlin mentioned, what's wonderful now, as of this month, we now have Welcome to Biosciences South, as it's called, our brand new building. And more exciting for me even than the fact that we have a new building with, would you believe, a butterfly on the side. Can you not see the white wings of the butterfly? No, neither could I, but trust me, that's what I've been told. <laughs> see, you need better science educating. I, I, I am so sorry, I wasn't the architect. I was involved with the inside. I wasn't involved with the outside. Well, the idea that the, this part here, this white, the white, oh, wish it wouldn't do this. The white bit is indeed meant to be a butterfly's wings. These, I think, are to actually help reduce solar, you know, heating, internal heating in the building. Merlin's nodding his head, so yes. Oh, it does get a fair amount of sun now that we're in, <laughs> trust me. So this is the new, the outside of the new building, which perhaps some of our local neighbours aren't so thrilled with, but nonetheless, I'm afraid it's there now, all $125 million worth of it. But what excited me is we now have new undergraduate teaching labs. So we've gone from this to this. These aren't yet complete because what's missing is we're going to have computers on every one of these bollards. So we'll actually have computers in the science labs. And why does that excite me and why is that so wonderful? Well, apart from we can now do lots of teaching within there, having the students do things. This pod shape here is, I'll hold my hand up and take responsibility for that. That was something I very much wanted so that the students would work as a, as a collective group together. But the computers, so that every student had access to computers, is because I think when we're training people to be scientists, we have an obligation to ensure that they have access to online resources immediately but even more, and so that we now train them from undergraduate stage how to do science in an appropriate way and record it properly. But also, this is a standard for good lab practice and research in industry. And where there are issues around scientific fraud, if we actually have them record their data online as they get it, then there is no possibility for fraud. So no writing it down on a bit of paper, taking it out of the lab and writing it up afterwards. From here on out, what we'll be doing is actually having them record their data as it happens in the lab. And we're now piloting some trials for online laboratory notebooks. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, <laughs> Don't know whether you know, but your portfolio is helping us with this. Thank you. Um, and uh, I have colleagues here, Noel and Namani, who've been working with um, one called Labster that we're trialling at the moment, so that the students record data. And this, to me, is an essential part of the new technology that we need to be keeping up with. Now, the other one is one that I've had a lot of fun with. And this is, um, when this goes wrong, what about doing something like this? And this is using virtual labs. So how did I come to work and want to work on virtual labs? It all actually came back to my time a long while ago as an undergraduate. This is one of the troublesome con concepts that I had to try and understand. It's all about the electron transport chain, how we derive energy in the cell. And I struggled with proton, I struggled with it. I just couldn't quite get it. And what helped me? Not this, even though I spent a lot of time doing this, just didn't do it for me. And where did I get my aha moment? No, it didn't even come from using a good textbook. It actually came from doing experiments in the lab. And when I actually tried it in the lab and added inhibitors and found out how it worked, then I could go back and understand the concept. So I was then so relieved. When I came to teach it, of course, I thought, fantastic. I'm going to do exactly the same. I came back here and I said, yep, that's what I'm going to do. It was just a little problem. The equipment and the supplies to do the kind of experiment you need to do this are very expensive. 
They're very challenging to work with and they're very hard to set up in an undergraduate teaching lab. Also, you have an in, your inability to interact with the students can be limited. We do use casual staff and they are wonderful, but we also need to make sure that they understand what they're trying to teach. So therefore, and this sounds awful as a control freak, I don't actually get to control the, the teaching. And that sometimes can be a struggle when I think it's a concept that's very difficult. So how do we resolve it? Fortunately for me, I met a wonderful computer nerd. He was doing his PhD here, draw Ben name, in computer science. And he talked to me about this idea he had for using an adaptive e-learning platform. And he had that concept and I had the idea about I really, really wanted to actually be able to offer the students this, exper this experience. And together what we came up with was to actually develop a virtual lab. And what I'm just reminding you here, if you're designing new technologies, what can be great? This is not interactive, it's not adaptive, so yes, you can learn, but it's not the best learning experience. Something that's far better for students is if they actually are interactive, so they stay awake and get to interact as you did when you voted with me. Even better for the teacher is if it's something that's adaptive. So it can adapt for individual students as they follow a path through this activity if the path changes as they come across different complexities. So we set up a lab for this. This was the, what we had. We put in introductory work into this online activity so students had to still engage with the theory. We actually introduced them to the apparatus that they would be using when they came to play with the theory. And then what we set them up for, and this is where I have to now fiddle with the technology for a sec, what we set them up for was to actually play in a virtual lab. And this is the lab we came up with. So here's the laboratory, here's the bench, here's the tool we use, it's called a pipette. You actually get to go, you pick up, you have to put a little special tip on this if you're going to work with it, and then you need to pick up some solution. You have to work out how much of a particular solution you need, so it sets you up to actually identify. Let's take two mils. Okay. We actually then take it, we move it, and we put it into the apparatus, and we dispense it. And as in all good labs, I'm going to throw away my tip, put this down, and you can see we've recorded what we've added. I'm going to turn on the chart recorder so that you can see what we're measuring is actually not that it matters too much to you, oxygen consumption. Just put in a lot of fresh buffer, it has plenty of oxygen in it. I'm now going to pick up my next tip. I'm going to add the mitochondria. And as you can see, this is a whole lot of fun when you're the one that gets to do it. It's extremely boring when you're the ones that get to watch it, but I'm having a great time. So we add this. And you'll see now that now we've added mitochondria, they're a bit leaky, or mitochondria are. You'll start to get a little bit of oxygen consumption. Now I'm going to give them some nice little substrate to play with. And I'll add a nice big dollop of that for it. And I'm going to add it in here. I feel like I'm doing one of those cooking shows. And you can see slowly the chart's going down and now I'm going to add the final ingredient. And what I'm hope is, hoping you're noticing as I'm doing this is that the chart is responding in real time to what I've added. This is exactly what would happen in the real laboratory. The chart would respond to the additions they made to this highly expensive piece of equipment here. And now I'll add the ADP, which is what's going to let this whole process start working. So what I have set up for the students then is a virtual lab that responds in real time to the experimental manipulations. The part that I love about it, apart from the fact that there are built in some things where they can't do, if they try to do the wrong thing, it reminds them, is that actually they can play. So in the real lab, I can never, we don't have the reagents, we don't have the time, we don't have the capability to let them play. And trust me, they do, they're like, oh, okay, well, what if I went and added a whole lot more of them? Go right ahead. Oh, I can? Yeah, go ahead. Add some more ADP. Let's see what happens. Look, it's levelling off. What happens if you go and add a bucket load? Go for it. They go for it. They add a bucket load. And in it goes. And look, the chart starts responding. 
So they then can start exploring. We have them um, play with this in so many ways. We can add different reagents and different chemicals. And, so that, and they can also, of course, do this in their own time. So for the students, this is a great way for them to get some to, to get exposure to something they couldn't normally. They can do actual experimental measurements off here. They can actually work out, for those of you who are scientists, they can actually work out the change in the slope directly from this because we've set it out appropriately so it will, so that it provides them with a wonderful learning experience. It teaches them good lab practice. You need to note down everything in the volume that you've added so that you can record your experiment properly. So it has a great facility, I think a great advantage for the students. The most frustrating thing probably is when the designers told me they put an Easter egg in here. Do you guys know what an Easter egg is? They've hidden something naughty in here. It takes, it takes them forever to find it. When they find it, it's a picture of me going, get back to work now. <laughs> Which, it's like, yes, thank you very much. So that's, that's why it's great for the students, even if they spend too much time looking for the Easter egg. But the thing that makes it great for us as academic staff is this, and this is the analytic part. So this is, I've developed other ones, this is one using it for a technical PCR polymerase chain reaction. The average grade of the students who took this was 76%, 93% of 1,087 students attempted it, so it's very, very scalable, but I can record it. And the adaptive feedback, the thing that they actually need to help them adapt and follow different progress through here is, has been activated 96% of the time. So though, then what you can do is you can actually go and have a look at the different questions that you set up for them to do. It shows you the average grade, how much time they spent on each of the activities. But perhaps more interestingly to me is you can follow, there's this great trace analysis here. So when I look at this, 996 students got the question right the first time. They just moved straight on through. Of those who didn't, let's look at these. 182 students stumbled on this question. But of those, the prompt that they got allowed 93 of them to actually then go on immediately and choose the right answer. The ones that didn't, the 63 who didn't, who came down here, the next prompt they were given allowed 50 of those 63 to then go on. So you can work out where do they stumble, which what's been the most effective tool to put in place to help them progress through without stumbling, or maybe you want them to stumble so that they have to think and learn more. But you can see individual students have all taken individual paths depending on where they've actually struggled the most. Because the ones you have to really worry about are these ones. It's like, mm, I don't know what we can do to help you. Because no matter what we put in place, I don't think you're ever going to get it. Um, but it's good to be aware that there is someone who maybe needs you. And you can identify who that student is. So you could reach out to them and go, have you ever considered doing business? I think you'll do wonderfully. <laughs> don't know that this is quite the thing for you. So that I find very, very, and it's really helped me a lot in designing these and working out what works well. The other thing is that you can, in fact, see the student results. So you can see how well they did. You can see how long they spent on the lesson. And although I don't want, don't want to show you names, you can export these results to a CSV file so that you can actually upload them into a gradebook. So you can use it for online assessment and see where they, all, where they went wrong. So that, to me, is a wonderful and powerful new use of the technology that I have had, I have to admit, um, a lot of fun playing with and designing experiments. Uh, in that platform. So, they're, vers they're versatile. That's the one I did where we just do it online only so that the students get to work online. This is one we designed. The students get to do work in what's called tissue culture laboratories, class two biosafety cabinets to work with challenging organisms. Here we actually give them one of these labs to do before so they can practice before they actually have to come in and try and use those skills in the lab. So they're better, better equipped. And they're also extremely versatile. So the one that I designed here, which is around using molecular techniques to work out family pedigrees for a disease gene, I can emphasise for the science students what's going on with the genetic background. And for the med students, I can repurpose it readily so that they can then use it for where they're more interested, which is in families and disease genes. So that's the part that I have found particularly fantastic. So 
I'm just going to go through these. It's personalised. You can do it anytime, anywhere. It's safe. We don't worry about issues in the lab. Better utilisation of wet lab time. That should say wet lab time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> because I know. It's, I was just thinking, did I really mean web lab time? Well, maybe. Um, and I do love that we want them to be the students to actually be explorers and this is a great way to let them explore because they can try out all those ridiculous things and find out what happens. So, and the analytics is, gives us great insights into student misconceptions. I want to reiterate now, I'm, I'm conscious that downstairs in about a few minutes there's going to be some, well five minutes there's going to be wine and cheese so I won't go on too much longer. Just to say again, we need graduates who are informed and analytical thinkers who can distinguish between facts and alternative facts, as uh, Trump has so wonderfully coined. But I also want them to remember that somewhere something incredible, as Carl Sagan said, is waiting to be known. And this is the other thing that I think matters so much. So here we have, I'm just going to give you a little showcase. We now actually are in the era of gene therapy where we can, in fact, treat genetic diseases and this is the um, severe combined immune deficiency. It's the first exemplar where uh, this disease was successfully treated in children. There's a caveat, some of the children got cancer as a result of the treatment. So why do we need a well-educated science community? Because we also need to make hard decisions about when and where to use this science appropriately. Um, DNA synthesis, can we create life just using the genetic code in the lab? Yes, there's the front cover of the journal called Science, where in fact this was reported, it was for a, a mycobacterium, where they actually artificially, artificially strung together all the A's and C's and G's and T's to actually make a fully functional organism that now can divide and survive on its own. So we're into a true revolution. Um, sequencing, I can't believe it, but there is the latest in DNA sequences. You can hold it in the palm of your hand. We can all now record our, work out our own DNA sequence, think about what you're going to do with the information. Something that's, I think, much closer to Merlin's heart, working with stem cells, his group of doing some amazing work looking at how to um, transform cells um, and have them express different genes. But it does bring a whole, usher in a whole new era of how we can, in fact, treat, because we can actually potentially start to grow new cells and organs in the laboratory. It's a wonderful and exciting time to be doing science, I feel. To wrap up, what I'd like to do is actually not make it about me. I'd like to make it about my students. Last year, I sent them assignment. Instead of Tropfest, I said, we're going to do Genfest. You actually have to produce a movie. And I, it was so hard. They are so creative and so clever. But they produced a movie, and I chose one I'll just show you a little bit of. The other thing I want to tell you, do I know how to make a movie? Did it matter? Did they? Of course. That's the wonderful thing about new technology is you don't have to be great with it, your students are. It's an age-old phenomenon that women live longer than men. And all of you are probably thinking, well, yeah, haven't you seen the dangerous stunts men try to pull off? You might be surprised to learn there are actually genetic differences between men and women that can be held accountable for the variation in lifespan between the sexes. There are numerous genetic theories that have been proposed in order to justify these differences. Most My favourite is women are tougher than men. Particularly the fact that females have two X chromosomes, whereas males have just one accompanied by a Y. And the way in which the dissimilitude between these chromosomes could be... Come on, technology. ...on three distinct theories. The unguarded X hypothesis maternally inherited mitochondria and sex selection, or sex-specific optimization. And hopefully, by the time you've finished watching, you'll be convinced that it is not only testosterone that shortens a male's life. And I'll stop there, but I just wanted to show you that there is a wondrous potential in all of our students, and they are actually going to be the ones that I help will help educate each other in ways that we have not even begun to think of. So she... So, remember, this is where I started. This is the great list that I had. And as I looked at it all, I thought, 20 years of teaching, how would I summarise it? And of course, I didn't need to. There's a wonderful American poet called Mary Oliver, and she did it for me. And she said her instructions for living our life are 
pay attention. There's so much that's going on that's amazing. Don't let it all flip past you. Pay attention. Be astonished. Let yourself be in awe of all the wonder that's around and then tell about it. And I think that's what I like to do. I am astonished by the amazing world of biology. I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to share that. Um, I find it extremely exciting. I love playing with the new ways that we can teach. And I'd just like to say thank you to you, to my mentors, to my colleagues and friends, but especially to the students. The corny line, they've taught me more than I've ever taught them. For me, it's true. Thank you all very much indeed. We use Smart Sparrow, yes. So it's a really good question. So um, the young lady at the front here said that that lab you did it was done in Smart Sparrow. How long did it take to put all that together? Um, and also, I think, how long? And how much does it cost? Um, that very first one that I showed you with the um, pipette and the oxygen electrode um, took quite a fair amount of time because it was the very first one we did and Draw was still doing his PhD at the time so we were actually developing it together. The part that took the time that matters the most to me is um, it's been explained to me like they do with filming. You need to prepare a storyboard. So as I would if I was setting up a lab class or if you were setting up a cooking activity, you'd say, okay, now you need to think about what you want to make, research the best way to do it, go find the right ingredients, get all the utensils, lay them all out and then start doing it. And that's what you have to do with these. You really need to lay it out very, very clearly, that storyboard, and also have in mind very distinctly what you want the students to, to learn from it and come away. Is it techniques? Is it conceptual? All those sorts of things. Um, once you've got the storyboard done, and I guess that depends on how quick you are, nowadays it's very much easier because Smart Sparrow have become very professional themselves, so they have a team of designers who help you do it. I think for a straightforward one, it's about 15,000, about that. We've developed many of them, and with Smart Sparrow's uh, agreement, we've put a lot of them up on the web, free and available for people to repurpose. The other thing I must, I don't want to be a one man singing band for Smart Sparrow, but the other thing that I love about it is I find it very easy to change. Um, and that makes a huge difference to me that um, it's not, there are other products out there that are fantastic, but what you see is what you get. You don't get to, whereas these you can adapt very, very readily. I hope that helps. Okay, sorry, we have to add to that the inspired image. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you know I like to be a bit provocative, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> and you so, know I like to spill wine on people after talks, don't perfect. you, Perfect. Yeah. So, um, look, the video was very beautiful, you know, you're showing the evolution of different diagrams, but more, more is not always more truth. There's also more untruth in it as well. So mm -hmm. it doesn't capture the essential stochastic nature of things happening at a molecular scale, does it? Everything was slotting into place like a machine assembling it. Oh. We had an example with a video that we had where they ran out of time, so the action potential, they just doubled it by playing it backwards, so the action potential is travelling up and down an axon both ways, which just doesn't ever happen in nature. And so there's lots of falsehood when you make things more complex as well, and the students can't distinguish that. Have you got any thoughts on, on that? I think that's a really, I think that's one of the, the most challenging aspects of it. Um, and I think how we curate is actually our responsibility. So I think as educators, we now have a responsibility. And I think the exemplar I gave, the trivial one, was Encyclopedia Britannica, and you pretty much were reassured. So how are we as a collective going to start working to put together a repository that isn't just Wikipedia? But that is, uh, um, so I know that anything that you have on the MedEd site 
has been reviewed by you guys and I can trust it. <laughs> Putting you on the spot here. Um, so I think we actually have, I think as it, we have a responsibility to do that. I think you know, if we don't, and if we're asking students because that's how they are learning, to keep using those resources, then we have to curate them in some way. Exactly how? Um, with your teaching initiative in terms of um, supporting science teachers and that, can you please make sure that you go over the hill and not just focus on Sydney? I've come out of um, working in rural New South Wales and they have no idea that some of the science that are being peddled in the natural resource world is really scary. They believe that things just appear out of nothing. So can we please make sure we get over the hill and try and convince some of those people to ditch the fairy tales they want to believe and um, get with the real story? Because that's seriously... Um, seriously appalling some of the stuff that landholders believe out there about what's, what is actually happening. Oh, thank you so much. Actually, we're looking for recruits to actually join us in this program, so... <laughs> I think you just volunteered, so perhaps we can catch up with you afterwards. I work for the library now, but... Um, oh. not, not So, anyway, I just... I, I, no, I so agree with you, and, and I hadn't realised... Um, the Museum of Human Disease here brings in groups from schools, but they also try and video and send videotape material out to the schools out in the in the remote and rural regions. And so, I feel that's something that we would love to be a part. And I think it matters so De very much. Definitely, yeah. having come out of where I have, I've hit made against a brick wall too often. I, how true, so... Well, we're trying to do it a bit in, I mean, we've now got a campus up in Port Macquarie, so we're, we're on the way a bit, well, for medicine we do, really. So, Louise, I thought that was terrific. I, the engagement was terrific. I love the photo you showed of the poor students sitting by themselves and, <laughs> and things like that, and, you know, we have to change that in the, the group work. But related to the question of... So I've noticed when I'm marking exams, I think the students are learning better. I look at my history and I think, I used to set exam questions, I'm probably getting better at doing it, and you know, half the class wouldn't attempt them and this sort of thing. I think they're learning better. But are we gonna be able to prove that? I mean, we, we really need a controlled trial, <laughs> but we don't have two universities to do one with your approach and one with the traditional, you know, overhead projector. But can we use this to test whether the students are learning more at a deeper level? I think that's the, there's two components to it, isn't it? It's are they learning more and at a deeper level? And I think one of the things that worries me a little about it is they've estimated now the average attention span of a student before they is six minutes. So we have this concern about are they learning more? of little discrete bits of information and do they then have the capability and maturity to synthesise that into a whole and do they then have the capacity and do they need that capacity to drill down and go deeper? And I think how we actually approach and measure that is, is challenging but I think it's very worthwhile. Um, I don't know whether you have a suggestion for how we could do it though. I did, I did a big project, we did a project looking at what's called threshold concepts for, for a first year class, the troublesome concepts that students have that they have to try and, once they've, accept, once they've grasped these troublesome concepts, they start to identify as, say, a biologist. And we did that and I tried to do it where we had 500 of our first year students learn, have one exposure to one thing and 500 have exposure to the other and then try and bring it back together. And I have tried to do it. It's very hard trying to, I thought with 1,000 students maybe we'll get the numbers we need, but having the 500 who are being made have one set of resources available to them and the other 500 have a different set of resources, what do you think they all do? Yeah. And you can't say to them, you can't share. Um, and so I agree, it becomes extremely challenging how to do that. Um, but I still think there are possibilities there if we, uh, if we look at it, especially with the, with the way we can data capture through things like that adaptive platform where you can see where they're actually going and therefore how, 
how they approach and how they move through a particular problem? Um, great presentation, Louise. Oh, thank I you very much. I thoroughly much. enjoyed it. Look, I, I want to this ask This is one of my mentors, I should say. The, the, this is the someone who inspired me to go into science. As being out of order, but since you're in your visionary mode, I was conscious that the contrast you showed historically, the student experience from what I can identify with um, to what a student gets now, is just absolutely dramatic. And I was contrasting that with the scientific experience. The fact that what hasn't changed, to my mind, in the years is what we scientists uh, read in the journals. A manuscript that was once done with letter set and a typewriter <laughs> and was now delivered online in a PDF file. Nonetheless, a scientific manuscript is still me uh, introduction, methods, results, discussion, the abstract, uh, a certain number of figures and a certain number of charts. And it, it seems remarkable that that way of conveying scientific knowledge at the professional level hasn't gone through the same uh, dramatic transition of getting information across that education has gone through. Why haven't we got a better way of getting scientists to communicate than, than we had 40 years ago? Well, thank you. I, I could make the, the flip answer, which is if only the researchers had talked to the educators, maybe they'd do a whole lot better. But I'll, I'll resist that temptation. I, I love that. I saw a quote from, duh, from MIT who said he thought the biggest revolution in biology would be the communication technologies and how we communicate, that he saw in the next 10 years that will be the revolution, not that we've sequenced the genome, not that we've got Casper Chris 9, sorry, that's a gene editing tool, not that we have any of those, techno but the fact how we actually learn to, how we actually communicate with each other. And my favourite journal actually is the Journal of Visual Experimentation, which we, the library subscribes to. And that is a wonderful way of actually visualising. And there's a student edition of that, of course, which is why I'm aware of it, which is a great way of communicating. So thank you. I, I quite agree. Um, and they have, um, they have a thing about people being what kind of learners you are. And I'm a bit of a visual learner. So I love flow diagrams. Can't we have things that are flow diagrams and that are images rather than just huge? Also, I don't know, all of you must be aware when you, that daunting thing when you see a, t a page of packed text. And students nowadays just don't engage with that. So I hope we'll continue to revolutionise there as well. So I would like Thank to you. Thank you.